in some ways, the Ukrainians have the manpower advantage because they are fighting willingly and they are fighting right. hard. The Russians, yes, having trouble now with the call up, people don't want to go. Right. OK. Uh, and as a, as a result, and they're not fighting with a will uh, in the same way. Ukraine, the Russian defense ministry is saying that they have taken the eastern city of Lysyshanks. Of course, Ukraine is pushing back uh, against this. I've been speaking with Rose Gottmuller. She's former deputy secretary general of NATO. I began by asking asking Rose how significant it would be if the city was to fall? It has a certain significance in that it symbolizes that Russia has overtaken now the key cities of Luhansk Oblast and has basically now control of that province. But I think that we have to note that these are really small tactical gains and that Russia has not been able to advance across the thousand kilometer front that it now has in Ukraine. And as they try, their forces will be spread increasingly thin. So yes, perhaps they have a tactical victory today in, in Lysychansk, but I don't think that it speaks anything to progress on the wider war. And just in terms of the, the wider messaging um, on Russian, Russia's progress, I mean, they're arguing that they are beginning to gain significant grounds. Um, the former British Army Chief Lord Dannett said this morning that he believes that Russia will take uh, the Donbass region. And at that point, the war will go into a, a deep freeze situation, very long, very protracted. I mean, what's your take on where we are? My personal view is that the Russians uh, will, in the end of the day, be more interested in ensuring their access to the southeast, where the important seaports are in the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. I really believe their focus will shift now from the Donbass to uh, to Kherson, to Mykolaiv, uh, to ensuring that they are able to control the ports on the Sea of Azov, Mariupol, where the great battle was in the spring, uh, that they will really want to make sure that they are controlling uh, those uh, seaports and the sea trade that goes from there. So um, whether or not they're able to seize the Donbass, I do expect to see them to shift the focus of their forces to those southeastern quadrants. But yes, this is a long war. It's a war of attrition. And uh, it really depends on who gets exhausted first. Mm. And on that point of who gets exhausted first, is this perhaps the sort of Russians now seeing an advantage with the long game just because they have got this huge supply of men to, to come and fight, and they have a bigger army than Ukraine. It's true that the Russians have a larger overall population than the Ukrainians. They're uh, you know, a country of, of uh, 11 time zones, as we like to say, stretching from Vladivostok all the way to Kaliningrad in the heart of Europe. So they are a big country but they have had a lot of demographic problems in recent years, and they are now having trouble with the call up of uh, draftees into their army. Uh, there aren't that many young men out there to just be killed like that in a war that is a, a needless war. So frankly, in some ways, the manpower advantage rests with the Ukrainians. President Zelensky early on declared a mobilization of all men up to the age of 60, and uh, the Ukrainians are fighting for their lives. They're fighting for their independence. And so uh, in some ways, the Ukrainians have the manpower advantage because they are fighting willingly and they are right. fighting hard. The Russians, yes, having trouble now with the call up, people don't want to go. Right, okay. Uh, and as a, as a result, and they're not fighting with a will uh, in the same way. So, so it's a question in my mind, uh, who has the advantage as far as uh, manning the army is concerned? Yeah, I see that's a good point. Ukraine has a, a much more motivated um, army, which is a good point. Um, now, the NATO secretary, um, Jens Stoltenberg, has announced plans to put 300,000 troops on high readiness. What is the significance of that announcement? It's important for your listeners to understand that this does not mean 300,000 troops newly deployed in Europe. What it means is that these are high readiness troops, they are trained and they are exercised 
Uh, they come to exercise and train in the very countries should they be called up because Russia has invaded, they would go exactly where they've been trained to fight. And that's a major step forward. It's uh, called a high readiness uh, reinforcement capability. And so this is uh, really, I think, a good step forward. Uh, there were um, about 40,000 such troops on high alert before, but now NATO has many more troops to call on. And frankly, it will be pre-positioning equipment and materiel, pre-positioning command posts, this type of uh, very sensible military activity that will support such reinforcements if they are called up. So it's a very good step. It's a very important step. And all NATO countries are involved in it, which is also important. Mm -hmm. Everybody has skin in this game. Okay. I mean, another thing I wanted to get your um, take on was um, all the world leaders gathered at the G7. And there were quite interesting comments from Boris Johnson, who said that he didn't think President Putin would have invaded Ukraine if he had been a woman um, and also talking about toxic masculinity and small man syndrome. I mean, what, what's your take on, on that, Rose? Well, if anybody should know about it, I suppose it would be Vladimir Putin since Napoleon back in uh, back uh, two centuries ago invaded uh, Russia uh, with people often talk about Napoleonic syndrome, right? <laughs> Somebody who's short. Um, in any event, I, I really can't comment on it. It does seem to me that this is a needless war. It came about because Vladimir Putin had a vision of some kind of Slavic heartland being recreated on Ukrainian territory with Russia and Belarus, uh, Russia, of course, being the leader among them. And no one shared that vision, uh, certainly not in Ukraine. And so even at the time, among his own leadership, they were quite taken by surprise, I think. Now this has all been forgotten as the Russian leadership has rallied around the flag. But I do think that that's the key point here. This is a needless war that was born of a, of a dream that Vladimir Putin had. And, and that's the great tragedy of it. So many lives are being lost. And do you think there is anything in the, the, the point that you know, it's, a, it's the counterfactual. So of course, it's, it's difficult to sort of have a substantive discussion about it. But it is often said that if there were more women in positions of global leadership, that there would be less conflict. I mean, do you think there's any truth in that, Rose? Or do you think it's just that women, women, women haven't been given the chance to start wars yet? <laughs> Well, let us hope that uh, in future years we will have uh, such uh, opportunities to see at first hand female problem solving. We have many women now in NATO who are ministers of defense, ministers of foreign affairs, and some national leaders as well. So I think that that is a good thing. It is difficult to predict. I will note in my own experience that, that women tend to have a more pragmatic problem solving point of view and they don't get so wrapped up in the vanity of the moment. So uh, perhaps that will have a beneficial effect going forward. But I agree with you, it's a counterfactual. We can't really tell now. Looking back in deep history, I suppose there's some examples of uh, women fighting hard in war, your own uh, your own Queen Bodicea, right, in the UK. Yeah. So, um, but it's hard to think of a lot of examples to tell you the truth. Thank you.